you, Dr. Taylor, and thank you for the introduction. And thank you for your incredible leadership with our Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And good evening and welcome to everyone that's here this evening. I'm honored uh, that so many members of our community have come out for this evening. As you've heard, it is going to be a great evening, certainly as we celebrate the remarkable life, the enduring influence of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. This is just part of the last week plus activities that we've had. I think it's hard to believe that Dr. King would have been 91 years old if his life had not been cut short, but yet the 39 years that he did live, he transformed our society and helped us to see and believe and develop the best versions of ourselves. And so as a university, we continue to honor his legacy. Uh, but even more, we continue to take a positive direction, a positive vision as we move forward. And we are committed here at the University of Alabama to providing a welcoming community for all of our students, our staff, and our faculty who are here at the University of Alabama. We have a lot of work to do at the university, but we also celebrate in the many achievements that our faculty, staff, and students have. It was great to see that just last week that Forbes magazine rec recognized the University of Alabama for its diversity. But again, we know that we have a starting place, but we have an ending place that we can move forward in such a greater manner. I do want to take a moment to recognize and to thank the MLK Commemorative Planning Committee for their leadership. They were integral in creating the events on our campus that has surrounded all the commemoration of MLK Day for this year. This year marked the second year that the committee has provided truly exceptional educational opportunities for our campus in addition to the celebrations that we've had. They highlight the life, the lessons, and the legacy of Dr. King. The theme of the committee, as you've heard through that hashtag, is Fierce Urgency Now which is a concept that Dr. King shared. Over this past month, the university community has honored and exemplified Dr. King's call to action now in a variety of ways. I'm very proud of our faculty, our staff, and students as they have rallied over the past week. As Dr. King himself reminded us, we are all stronger when we walk together and when we work together in unity. A few events that have occurred earlier this month are focused on the children in our communities. We know that Dr. King had a vision for his children and really for all people. His powerful words continue to resonate with us today that we can be a country that will not judge a person's worth on their race, but rather on their character and their integrity. To highlight the innocence of children and the importance of education, our School of Social Work sponsored a book drive for Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School. Campus volunteers have been reading all week there. If you feel so led, you can certainly support that as volunteering as a reader even this week, as well as giving to their library. Our Black Faculty and Staff Association also held readings at the Alabama, or I'm sorry, at the Alberta Head Start School, again reaching some of our youngest people in our community who need us in their lives and who need us to show them the value of an education to their future. Other sponsored events included a special exhibit that honored authoring Lucy Foster, which is still on display at MLK um, Elementary. It was sponsored by UA Special Collections. Last week, our Intercultural Diversity Center hosted tables in the Ferguson Center that was dedicated to Dr. King's legacy. Students had the opportunity to engage in critical conversations that we hope will positively shape their worldview. Excerpts from Dr. King's The American Dream, that speech were also shared in the Bedsell Courtroom, sponsored by the UA School of Law. Listeners were reminded of Dr. King's vision for all of mankind. His words continue to be a source of inspiration for us, but also for many generations to come. As part of our celebration, we also honored the life and legacy of Dr. King through the 2020 Realizing the Dream Banquet and Concert. A week ago, sponsored in part by the UA's Division of Community Affairs. At those events, we had the privilege of hearing from award-winning journalist Laura Lane, and we enjoyed the talents of Grammy-nominated gospel artist Jonathan. Friends. Then last Monday, many of you in this room, volunteers gathered for MLK Day to Action. That is a day of service, not a day off. And our students, our faculty, and our staff served our community during that time. 
And today we have held a powerful discussion at the law school, which was moderated by our honorable Judge John England, who is one of our trustees that have been featured compelling conversation with Dr. U.S. Yusuf Salam, who is our guest speaker tonight. Dr. Salam also met with the class of criminology, uh, class of criminology <laughs> students earlier this morning and certainly shared his incredible story with those students, all of which we can gather insight and I think we can learn from them. We are deeply privileged to have him on our campus. These events I mentioned are just a few of the ways that the University of Alabama continues to honor the legacy of Dr. King and continue to call us to be the best version of ourselves and also to be the best version of the university community that we can be. And so we will continue to honor uh, Dr. King, certainly in this January, but we will also demonstrate through our own actions that behavior this semester and all year long. So with every event, we're witnessing, I believe, the heart of the University of Alabama campus. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your investment in the lives and dignity of others, and I know that we'll leave here deeply changed by Dr. Salam's words. May they continue to fuel our efforts as we look to be a better community and better individuals. Thank you all. Alabama Social School of Social Work, University of Alabama Law School, University Programs, uh, the Dean of Students, our Dr. Martin Luther King Commemorative Committee that we've spoken about with the Intercultural Diversity Center, Community Affairs, Financial Affairs, Academic Affairs, Student Government, the Home Coverhouse School of Business, the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice, the College of Human and Environmental Science, and the University Printing Services. And we want to say thank you to all of them for making this week possible. Join me in giving them a hand, please. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce Eric Robinson, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Eric is a junior major in elementary education. He's involved with the Afro-American Gospel Choir. And if you have not heard him sing, you've missed him missing. Okay. Uh, he is also the corresponding secretary there. He's the programming team lead at University Programs, Chief of Staff for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Student Government Association, a member of Calvin Delta Pi International Educational Honor Society, and a part of the Equal Opportunity Standing Committee. Please join me in welcoming Eric to the stage. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to an evening with Yusuf Salam. The University of Alabama is honored to have our Yusuf Salam as a Martin Luther King Jr. keynote speaker for this year's installment. We'd like to thank all of our campus partners, student organizations, community members, faculty, and staff, in addition to everyone who served on the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commemorative Committee. And maybe following Dr. Salam's keynote speech, we'll have a Q&A, and if you'd like to book sign, we'll commence in the Anderson Room. On April 19, 1989, a young woman with a problem for life was groovy raped and left for dead in New York City's Central Park. Five boys, four black and one Latino, were tried and convicted of the crime in a frantic case that rocked the city. They, be they became known collectively as the Central Park Five. Their convictions were vacated in 2002 after spending between 7 and 13 years of their lives behind bars. The identified DNA in the Central Park Jarvis case, unlinked to any of the five, had finally met his owner, a convicted murderer and serial rapist who confessed. The convictions of the boys, now men, were overturned and they were exonerated. One of those boys, Yusuf Salam, was just 15 years old when his life was upended and changed forever. Since his release, 
Yusuf has committed himself to advocating and educating people on the issues of false confessions, police brutality and misconduct, press ethics and bias, race and law, and the disparities in America's criminal justice system. In 2013, documentarians Ken and Sarah Burns released a documentary, The Central Part 5, which told us of this travesty from the perspective of Yusuf and his cohorts. In 2014, The Central Part 5 received a multi-million dollar supplement from the city of New York for his grievous injustice against them. Yusuf was awarded an honorary, honorary doctorate that same year and received the President's Life Achievement Award in 2016 from the President Barack Obama. He was appointed to the Board of the Innocence Project in 2018 and has released the next Netflix feature limited series called When They See Us, based on the true story of the Central Park Five with Avery DuVernay, Oprah Winfrey, and Robert De Niro in May of 2019. Please help me in one way, Dr. Yusuf Salon. came back a second time around and ran over me again. Because in 1990, after I was bailed out, I had so much hope that the system was going to prevail. I mean, it was like at that moment, I still held out hope that the truth was going to come out. And then I was let down in the worst way. And when we came into the courtroom and the jury foreman stood up and said, we have the verdicts. And of course they said, as you see on TV, please rise. And then they said, my name. I heard the words guilty echoed so many times, but I lost count. I didn't have time to prepare. Sometimes in these situations, they give you an opportunity to go home and kiss your loved ones, have that last meal that you won't be having in a long time. Do some things that you might be thinking about doing. Going to jail for a crime that you didn't commit is like losing a loved one. You used to be there, but tomorrow you wake up and you think that it was a nightmare. Going to the bedroom, I'm sure my mother ran into the bedroom to look under the covers, to look under the bed, to wonder if what happened was real. We cried. We cried and it was so, it was so painful. And we held on to each other. Before 1989, we didn't know each other. The guys that I went to 
trial went, they separated the trial, and they put my good friend Corey Wise on the second half of the trial, and they put me on the first. And I went to trial with Raymond Santana and Andrew McCray. All along, what I couldn't understand is it, although I've been over six feet tall since I've been 12 years old, that every day that I walked into the courtroom, what I couldn't reconcile with was why were they looking at me with such hatred in their eyes? When I got convicted, I was told that I would have something to say. There would be an opportunity for me to say my last words. And in my mind, I thought that this would be the very last time that I would be able to speak. And so all there were folks there saying, throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Try to seek the least amount of time possible. My mother was raised that she would tell me in the Jim Crow South. My mother's actually from Birmingham. And my mother was teaching me, all while I was going to school, she was teaching me a parallel education. She was teaching me about Denmark, BC. She was teaching me about Tucson Overture. She was teaching me about my hero, El Haj Malik Shabazz, also known as Malcolm X. She was teaching me about my hero, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She taught me about Asana Shakur. She taught me about the struggle. And all up until that moment, I couldn't figure out why was she equipping me with this legacy of struggle in America. And then the spike wheels of justice came and run me down. <coughs> These, this, This reality, many have found themselves, it pulls at the fabric of the fiber of the human family. It leaves gaping holes. It pulls at the fabric of the fiber of the community and the neighborhoods. It leaves gaping holes. And as you look around America, this place that's supposed to be one, we're supposed to stand and all salute the flag. You find some kneeling because this is separate and unequal. They asked me in 1990, I turned 16. They asked me if I had anything to say before they sentenced me. I said yes. And I rose to my feet. The interesting thing that happened was that as I rose to my feet, I began to see what they saw. And as I rose, they began to shrink right before me. Even though I was in bondage, I was perhaps the most powerful at that time. I didn't realize that what I would say would become part of the court record. I didn't realize that what I would say would find its way in movies. I didn't realize that what I would say would be said almost 31 years later here in Birmingham, Alabama, Tuscaloosa.
right, we're going to go out. Social media, there we got it. There we got it. Social media, got it. They don't have memes about me. But as I rose to my feet, I don't think that I gave it a second thought. In my mind, this was the last time that I would be able to say something. In my mind, this was my opportunity. This was me fighting back before the death blow. I rose to my feet, and this is the words that came out. I said, I'm not going to sit here at your table and watch you eat and call myself dinner. Sitting here at your table doesn't make me dinner. Just like being here in America doesn't make me an American. True. Let us begin. Stress is the anger that is built up inside. Rage is the anger that is no longer built. Taking on a sucker that soon you have killed. American free will doesn't mean you can kill. And take another person's life, you live your life trite. I'm a skill builder, so my skills I can build. Creator giving knowledge to this wise black man, soon to enhance our words across the land. I'm a smooth type of fellow, cool, calm, and mellow. I'm kind of laid back, but now I'm speaking so that you know. Got used and abused and even was put on the news, but I pulled some game clothes, selling out like fools, and I check it. Put in a situation that you don't know what to do and some brothers go wildin' when I'm down with them. Who would have thought I had to lock in? I stand accused. Checking the scene from how the situation was. Instead of getting facts, the media made you blur. Now the people don't know. All they see is the media. Never hear the blame because they're constantly deceiving us. The DA's wrong. This is her master plan. This case is not a case, it's just a crack that's sham. Yo, instead of trying to get your name made, it's reconstructing the crime that really pays. Islam, la ilaha illallah, being supreme over Satan, but no man is a law, your summer. Science drop along the righteous path, so how the hell could I take a rapist path? Think about that and then think about this. All my friends, it was me they dissed and dismissed, because I don't really need any friends like that. Like when I really needed you, where were you at? I'm not dissing them all, but the one that I called that tried to diss me, like I was an inch small, like a rat, a mouse, not even a man, only accused, like the knife's in my head. How does it look? Me clock, now I'm shook, but like Matlock, soon the accused is off the hook. It's real when she remembers and says, damn, the cops did you win. I stand accused. You people stop. This racial disperse. Hey, yo, you seen that kid, Benson? He's in a hearse. And so we take it to the Benson Hurst fields, writes the bulletproof vest. We had no kinds of shields. How does it look? They killed a black man being black. It's time we take a stand. In our situation, they saw our faces clear, not mine. Not because of fear. It's because the black race was disgraced and full of Muslim. They must have felt shame. But I'm not to blame with the word you boy. The media took our words to paper. The ones the cops distorted. Told the cops truth like this, and then boom, they were smacking my man Corey Wise in the next room. Now I know why the rosters can't stand the Bobby Lawn. They never helped, they just battle on. I used to think the people and cops were cool, but who protects us from you? I stand accused. I tell you. Yes, they had rap applications. 
<laughs> I picked up my rap application, took it home myself. I'm the youngest hip hop artist out there. I mean, I had, I had aspirations. I feel like I may have had some bars. I mean, you know. <laughs> Man. Took it home, got Kofi. Now this is years later. I'm facing the worst experience that you could ever imagine. Dr. King was known for the I Have a Dream speech. But when Dr. King woke up, they assassinated him. Everybody in America wants the American dream. There are some of us who wake up to the American nightmare. Our job is to shift the paradigm collectively. Our job is to become modern day alchemists to rearrange the order of things. In this era, we have children of former slaves and children of former slave owners <coughs> making up the kaleidoscope of the human family and all wanting to push forward together in unison, in resemblance to the dream that Dr. King dreamt. When I stood up, what I saw was what they were trying to kill. You see, six months into my prison bid, an officer walks up to me and asks me a question. The question sounds simple enough. This question he asked me, <coughs> he said, hey, young brother, who are you? I said, I'm Yusuf Salam, one of the guys they accused of raping the Central Park Jive but I didn't do it. To my surprise, he said, I know that. He told me, this officer in the jail told me, I've been watching you. You're not supposed to be here. Why are you here? Who are you? I remember thinking, I don't know. I remember thinking, you know, when I was growing up, people would always say, hey, what's your name? And I would say, Yusuf. And they would say, Joseph. <laughs> that don't even sound like Yusuf. I mean, I it's like somebody just chop up your whole name. <laughs> and of course, I would say, no, Yusuf. And they would say, Joseph. <laughs> you know, as I've been on the speaking circuit for about 20 years, I found out they have this thing called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Program. You know, sometimes children do this without even realizing that they're doing it. It's a little bit of technology, but not really. Subliminal suggestions. I was doing this when I was younger. I mean, you would, you would, it's about negotiation. It's about getting the person to, to agree, to agree with you, right? And so I would say, no, you, sir. And I would shake my head just like that. <laughs> and they would say, Joseph. <laughs> It's crazy, like back in the days, you know, there was this, there was this time, sometimes folks have this experience now, there was this time back in the days where if you had an interesting sounding name, people had like this speech impediment, they just couldn't say it, so I kind of like slowed it up a bit. You, you 
Cristo. <laughs> and he was like, Joe. <laughs> I said, you know what, that's close enough. <laughs> I actually didn't know. I didn't know that Yusuf is the Arabic equivalent to the word Joseph in the Bible. You know, xenophobia has this way of making us afraid. I often think, like, you know, sometimes as I'm running to the plane, you know, because I got to get there. And imagine, imagine me running to the plane, and I get to the plane, and I, I finally get there, and I huff and puff it. I said, whew, get on the plane. <sighs> so I passed me, you know, I'm not even in first class, let's take the person's water to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Woo! God is the greatest. Man, some people are going to be like, hold on, brother, take, do that again, let me go lie. <laughs> But imagine me doing the same thing, same example, same thing. And I said, Allahu Akbar. Man, listen, I'm not getting on that plane. They're going, they dragging me off that plane. I mean, xenophobia. Hey, brother, what did you just say? I said, God is the greatest. Okay, cool, high five. Yeah, that's what's up. Okay, whew, you almost scared us there for a second. You almost going like, oh. This question that this officer asked me, it, it caused me to go down the rabbit hole. As I, as I went deep into this question, what I found out was that I didn't know the meaning of my name. I started searching and I started looking at different books of names and the meaning of the names and I came across this one book and it said Yusuf comes from the Hebrew that means God will increase. As I'm doing this research, I found out that in the culture that I was born into, we didn't, we, we were born nameless. That instead of a baby shower celebrating me before I came to this world, that I was celebrated seven days after I was born. They had what they call a baby naming ceremony. They called the whole community to come. And people were trying to find out because they looked at babies as gifts, as presents. And this question that they wanted to know was, who is this? And my parents revealed on the seventh day that my name is to be known as Yusuf Idris Fa'adri Salam. Now that's a lot, so usually I just say Yusuf Salam. <laughs> But in my book of poetry, I answered this question after I did a deep dive. The question is, who are you? And the answer is searching to find who has come. A beautiful soul, a powerful one. When I started researching what my name meant, and I found out that Yusuf didn't only mean Joseph, but that Yusuf meant God will increase. I found out that Idris meant the teacher. I found out that Fa'adun is with justice. And I found out that Salam means peace. I'm in prison six months into my bed and finding out for the first time that my parents named me what it means God will increase the teacher with justice and peace. I was, I was blown away. I was trying to figure out, as you can imagine, you struggle with faith. And you, you 
ask God, why me? I mean, I was praying to God so much that sometimes I would wake up and I would be still in a position of prostration. They say when you pray to God, that's you talking to God. And they say when you meditate, that's God talking back. And I would pray, I would pray often. They say that you should hold on to the rope that God extends to you with the teeth in the back of your mouth. That kind of faith I had and I built while I was in prison. And I'm reading everything that I could get my hands on. My grandmother's writing me letters. She also was born in Birmingham. I probably just need to start saying Alabama, right? <laughs> <laughs> but my grandmother would write me these letters. And every letter that she wrote me, she addressed it to Master Yusuf Salam. <clears throat> my grandmother passed away, and I never got the opportunity to ask her. How did she do that? Because in my mind, as I was going through this bid, I was growing through this bit. And in my mind, I was subliminally being told to straighten my back. I didn't even realize until I became an adult and I started thinking about this. I said, wow. You know, every letter that goes through the prison industrial complex, every single one without fail, gets screened. That means that the officers in the jail had to read, this is to Master Yusuf Salam. And I had to read it too. My grandmother, in her infinite wisdom, was trying to tell me something. Perhaps she was telling me that I was a master of my faith. Perhaps she was trying to encourage me that I did not need to not remain vigilant. But I needed to do the time. I didn't need time to do me. Because if time did me, I would think that I was an accident of time. Years later, I meet the world famous Les Brown. Les Brown said to me, he said, you know, Yusuf, you matter. I said, thank you. He said, no, you don't understand. You matter, perhaps more than you even know. You matter, and everyone matters, because we were all born on purpose. He said to me, every single one of us, when our parents got together, we each were one of over 400 million different options. And we made it. I mean, it's the story of the birds and the bees. But we made it. It's one of the some, some folks was like, <laughs> my time. But the fact that we made it should indicate that we were born on purpose. And if we were born on purpose, you have to know, this is less talking you have to know that you have a purpose. He said, Nietzsche says that if you can find the why, you can live anyhow. While I was in prison, I was taking the lemons that life gave me and making them in me. I sometimes would come back to my cell and just like a moron, I would see Tropicana orange juice and Intimus cookies. And I happen to like Tropicana orange juice and Intimus cookies. Then I would hear my mother's voice in the back of my head telling me that she was raised in the Jim Crow South. I said, they're trying to kill me with the food. I'm like, no, they're not going to get me. And 
I'll never forget this wise woman in the jail who was also an officer. She comes to me one day and she says, Yusuf, have you been getting the goodies that I've been leaving for you? And I said, wow, you left those for me? She said, yes. I said, why did you leave that for me? She said, Yusuf, I know you're not guilty, but I can't take this key and let you go free. Every time I'm here, this is my way of trying to make your time as easy as possible. I was like, wow. You see, as I emerged from the prison seven years later, I started thinking about the whole journey. I started thinking about these books that I read. You know, there's a story in the Bible that talks about this prophet named Yusuf. His name is Joseph. There's a story in the Quran that talks about this prophet named Joseph. His name is Yusuf. This prophet who was chosen by God, who was thrown away by his brothers because of jealousy, who was picked up and sold for a few coins because they didn't know who they had. Who, in some reports, said that this man was given half of everything beautiful placed in the world. That's how attractive this man was. That as he was purchased by the ruler, and he grew up and started to mature, he began to become more attractive. That the young lady whose house he grew up in, she began to secretly desire him. She desired him so much that one day her emotions got the best of her. And she was there alone with him and she closed the door and she said, you gonna give me some. <laughs> Shuffle, you know what I'm saying? You're real good. You try to break their ankles and stuff like that. Uh, Kobe was nice. Kobe made us all with basketball. Yeah. But he was trying to shake her. She reached out for him, ripped, ripped his shirt from the back, and all of a sudden the, the door flew wide open. Her husband was standing right there. This was like a back in the day so much. <laughs> she all of a sudden got herself together and said, what is the punishment for one who seeks to uh, be with the wife of the ruler of the house? And then one of the relatives saw what was going on. He was like, look here. <laughs> he, ain't gonna, he, he was so smooth, but he didn't even say, she lied. He just was like, surely if his shirt is ripped from the front. <laughs> He's lying and she's telling the truth. But if his shirt is ripped from behind, that means uh, she lied. He's telling the truth. And his shirt was ripped from behind. You know, the ruler told his wife, he said, listen, come on. I don't really know the whole conversation, but it might have been something like this. Like, I know I'm a little bit seasoned, you know, young strapper, whipper snapper brother right there, you know what I'm saying? You know, sometimes walking around with his chest out, you know what I'm saying, doing push-ups and all of that stuff, looking real good. I see him looking good. But come on, man, don't be disrespecting me like that. <laughs> yourself together. <laughs> then he went to Brother Yusuf, Brother Joseph, and said, listen, can you keep this between us, man? I'm not sure about it, man. I mean, come on, man. I know you got it. 
But the word had already gone out. The woman in the town had already heard what they needed to hear. They started gossiping about her. It was like she wants one of the peasant toys <laughs> or her boy toys. <laughs> she wants one of the peasant boys. <laughs> And she heard this and she said, man, I'm going to go, man, big chill up. I ain't never seen a party like the party I'm about. <laughs> so they threw this, she threw this party and she invited all the ladies to the house and they all was eating fruit. I can imagine they was feeding themselves grapes and stuff like that, man. Then she asked Brother Yusuf, Brother Joseph, to come. And she said, hey, come on in here. I need, to, I need you to bring me my bottle of water. <coughs> <laughs> you know, he came in there, and every single one of those ladies cut their hands. They said, this is not, this is not a person. This is a noble angel. She then said, you're going to give me some now. <laughs> He was stronger in his spirit. He said, no, I would rather go to jail than what you call me to. And they sent him to jail for break. I was reading this in prison. They sent him to jail for break. I was sent to jail for break. His name was Yusuf. I was dumbfounded that my parents named me Yusuf. I heard about a man named Abraham, and it was so angry at Abraham because all he said was there's only one God. And as he broke up all of their statues and left the big one, they called him to question and he said, why would you do this to our statues? They were so angry at the answer he gave that they built this fire that was so big. This fire was so hot. They couldn't even get close to it. They had to build a catapult in order to fling him in the fire. And when they flung him in the fire, God told the fire, be cool and safe. When they flung me in the fire, God told the prison, be cool and safe. I know we're about to start Q&A, and I just want to preclude the Q&A with this statement. As we refocus the lens on the Central Park Jada case, I want you to think about this. The Central Park Jogger case is actually a love story between God and his people. It's a story of a criminal system of injustice turned on its side in order to produce a miracle in modern time. It's a story of how people can be brought low only to rise because the truth can never stay buried. It's a story of a people buried alive and forgotten. A system for God we receive. And instead of a social death, we emerge like the phoenix from the ashes. Because as they built the fire to consume us, they forgot the owner of the heat. Stop there for, for Q and A and open up the floor. This is I, this story is so so much. I got a lot of stuff to say, but uh, I want to I want to definitely give the audience an opportunity to ask questions, to give me their thoughts and feedback or anything like that. All right, everyone. If you will line up where the mics are if you have questions. 
we're going to get as many questions as possible. As we, as we wind up, what I'll do is I'll read a piece of poetry. This is actually, you know, in this book, I just want to let you know what this, is, what this book is. In this book are words that I had to constantly repeat to myself to constantly positively charge myself so that I can remind myself what was at stake. Because if I didn't tell myself these words, I would become an accident of time. You know, Dr. Maya Angelou said, you should be angry, but you must not be bitter. She said, bitterness is like a cancer that eats upon the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. And then she tells us to use that anger. She said, you dance it. You march it. <coughs> You voted. She said, you do everything about it. And then she said, you talk it. You never stop talking. I was in prison, and this poem came to me. It's called, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. I can't remember when that statement made me sad inside. Too young to be in it. Now I couldn't even see it. Why? Why couldn't the revolution be televised? The last poets, Gil Scott Heron, as I grew up, I began to see. They left theirs, and I too wanted to leave a mark on history. A man in half, and I wanted to bask in that task that set men free. But a revolution, the revolution, is where I knew I had to be. The revolution will not be televised. They didn't want to display the victory of those quote unquote lesser men. The revolution will not be televised. Smile, I know, because I am the revolution. So if you have a question, we actually have a mic stand here if you want to go ahead and line up. Also, there is a mic stand in the middle of the aisle. We're going to get as many questions as possible. So please, if you would like to line up to ask questions, please do so. And if you need us to bring a mic to you, we would be happy to do so. But in terms of time, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Immediately following, we will do a book signing in the Anderson Room where you can purchase a book for $25 and you will personally sign it. But right now, we're going to do question and answer for the next 10 to 15 minutes. So if you have questions, Andrew will be standing here. If you have questions, Adam will be standing there if you have questions. And we will get as many as possible. Please don't be shy. <laughs> All right. If you are going to exit, please exit as quietly as possible. If you are going to exit, please be mindful of people asking questions and exit as quietly as possible. We do understand that individuals have to go. Hi, the question that I have is, um, in reference to your website, what does moving from the world of yesterday's upset to tomorrow's victories look like, and how can we make steps towards achieving that? You said in reference to my website? To your website. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> moving from the world of yesterday's upset to tomorrow's victories. So, moving, the, moving from the world of yesterday's upsets to tomorrow's